But to many religious people of the time, infinity corresponded to God. After all, God is said to be infinite. And suggesting there are many infinities is tantamount to declaring that there are many gods. So Cantor's ideas were opposed on religious grounds as well, as they threatened the idea of monotheism, the existence of one all-powerful God. Indeed, Cardinal Johannes Franzelin equated transfinite numbers with pantheism, belief in more than one God. While today we may scoff at this, Cantor's understanding of infinite sets, he actually used the term transfinite rather than infinite, does indeed challenge our intuition. Cantor showed that the set of all rational numbers is in one-to-one -one correspondence with a proper subset of the set of all irrational numbers. But the set of irrational numbers is not in one-to-one -one correspondence with the set of all rational numbers or any of its subsets. We say that the cardinality of the set of all irrational numbers is therefore larger than the cardinality of the set of all rational numbers. But we also know that between any two irrational numbers there is a rational number. So how can the set of irrational numbers be of bigger cardinality than the set of rational numbers? Our intuition says that this cannot be, but our intuition is simply wrong. It took 20 years before the opposition to Cantor's discoveries died down. In 1900, arguably the greatest mathematician of his time, David Hilbert, delivered a plenary lecture at the International Congress of Mathematics. Hilbert gave a list of 23 open problems and much of the creativity of research mathematicians during the 20th century was focused on these famous problems. The first of these problems was due to Cantor and has become known as the Continuum Hypothesis. It suggested that there are no uncountable sets of cardinality strictly less than that of the set of all real numbers. Not only did David Hilbert give great kudos to Georg Cantor by listing Cantor's problem as the first in his list of 23 problems, but he also defended Cantor from his critics by declaring, no one shall expel us from the paradise that Cantor has created. And in 1904, the British Royal Society awarded Cantor its Sylvester Medal, the highest honour it can confer on a mathematician. The mathematician and philosopher Gottlob Frege used Cantor's theory to produce a formal system of mathematics based on logic. But paradoxes were discovered, in particular by the British mathematician Bertrand Russell, while he studied Frege's work.
the Russell paradox was devastating to Frege and to the mathematical community in general. It was as follows. Let S be the set of all sets. Then clearly S is a member of itself. So some sets are a member of themselves and other sets are not a member of themselves. So we can define B to be the set of all sets which are not a member of themselves. That is, B is the set of all sets which are not a member of themselves. The question is, is B a member of itself? So let's first assume that B is not a member of itself. Then B is a set which is not a member of itself. But by the very definition of B, every set which is not a member of itself is a member of B. So B should be a member of B. That is, B is a member of itself. So we started with the assumption that B is not a member of itself, and we ended up with showing that it is a member of itself. So we clearly have a contradiction. So our assumption has to be wrong. What was our assumption? That B is not a member of itself. So we must have that B is a member of itself. So by definition of B, B is not a member of B. Because B contains the sets that are not members of themselves. So B is not a member of itself. But we started with B is a member and end up with B is not a member. So again we have a contradiction. So we have proved that the statement B is a member of itself and the statement B is not a member of itself each lead to a contradiction. So we have a paradox. There is something terribly wrong. What is wrong is that it cannot be true that every collection of things is a set and in particular, allowing sets to be a member of themselves leads to a paradox. So sets have to be very carefully defined to exclude this possibility. Ernst Zermelo came to the rescue of mathematics with axioms for set theory which exclude the possibility of any set being a member of itself.
building on the work of Frege and Cantor, and carefully noting Russell's paradox, in 1908, Zamello produced the first axiomatic set theory. Using Zamello's axioms, new sets are constructed in a recursive fashion in a finite number of steps using only pre-existing sets. His axioms had two undefined terms, set and epsilon, or is a member of. In due course, Zamello's axioms were found to be inadequate, in particular in order to define the natural numbers. And it was known that if you can define the natural numbers, then you can proceed to define the rational numbers, and using an approach due to Richard Dedekind, you can define the real numbers. Amongst those who amended Zermelo's axioms for set theory was Abraham Frankel, who became the first dean of mathematics at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Today, the zermelo frankel axioms for set theory, also known as the ZF axioms, are the most generally accepted starting point for set theory and hence for the foundations of mathematics. By this we mean that theorems in mathematics can be translated into the language of zermelo frankel set theory and proved using ZF axioms. So we shall now state the zermelo frankel axioms. Unfortunately, there is no standard numbering, wording, or even naming of these axioms. We will now discuss the zermelo frankel axioms one by one. The first axiom is the axiom of extensionality. It says that two sets are equal if and only if they have the same members. This uh, seems not in the least bit surprising. The second axiom is the empty set axiom. This says there is a set with no elements. It may seem surprising that you have to add an axiom which simply says the empty set exists. But the fact is, if you don't add it, how do you know that it exists? The third axiom is called the pairing axiom. If A and B are sets, then there exists a set whose only members are A and B. I mentioned that in the special case that A and B are the same set, then S, of course, is a singleton set, a set with one element. In all other cases, S has precisely two members. The next axiom is the union axiom. It says that if we have a finite number of sets, then the union of that finite number of sets exists. Or if we have an infinite number of sets, then the union of that infinite number of sets exists. Axiom 5 is the power set axiom. It says, if S is any set, then the power set of S exists. That is, the set of all subsets of S exists.